real pleasure to welcome all of you to the John Cook School of Business here at St. Louis University. We're really honored to be one of four presentations that are part of the Centennial Speaker Series for Beta Gamma Sigma. As many of you know, and you'll hear a little more about this later, Beta Gamma Sigma is the Honor Society for Schools of Business, and we're pleased to offer a special welcome to students and alumni uh, members of Beta Gamma Sigma who are attending the program this evening. We're really so happy that we can broadcast this presentation via our webcast, and that's allowing members worldwide to participate in the event. And just by watching the registrations now of people who've come online, we know we have people who are joining us from Kuwait and Lima, Peru, and Canada. I mean, it's, this, is, this is really the miracle of modern technology, and I'm so pleased that we're able to be part of it. I'd especially like to recognize alumni chapters that have coordinated meetings with this program. We have the Beta Gamma uh, Sigma chapter, alumni chapter at Loyola University in Chicago, the Beta Gamma Sigma Charlotte alumni chapter, uh, and the University of, of uh, North Carolina at Charlotte, the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh, and the University of Manitoba are all chapters that we know that have arranged uh, to have uh, a, a chapter meeting along with this presentation. And so we, we're thankful that you did that and appreciate your involvement with your Beta Gamma Sigma alumni chapter. I know that you're all looking forward to the program this evening, but before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to let you know that we have a real special treat for us. And this is one of those unexpected bonuses. Dr. Kurt Hunter is, pres is president of the Board of Governors of Beta Gamma Sigma, and he's with us this evening. Kurt's distinguished career has included appointments as the Dean of Tippy College of Business at the University of Iowa uh, and the School of Business at the University of Connecticut. He's also served as a Vice President of Research at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. He's had faculty positions at Emory, uh, Atlanta University, uh, the University of Georgia, Chicago State University, and Northwestern University. So I'd, uh, I'd be very happy if you would help me welcome Dr. Kurt Hunter to the podium to bring you greetings from Beta Gamma Sigma. Good evening. Thank you, Ellen, for that uh, kind introduction. On behalf of Beta Gamma Sigma's Board of Governors and the Society's 700,000 lifetime members, I want to thank you for attending this Meet the Leaders in Business event tonight. I also would like to welcome members who are participating in the event through the live uh, webcast, as Ellen mentioned, especially uh, those in Lima, Peru, and Kuwait, and Canada, including uh, the others in Charlotte, uh, Chicago, uh, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and uh, Manitoba, Winnipeg, Manitoba. So it's truly a global audience tonight, and it shows you that uh, the global reach of Beta Gamma Sigma is truly, truly effective. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, we also have members logged in from around the United States as well as, well as around the world, and I want to welcome those that are taking part in the webcast in their own individual homes and offices tonight. Uh, this event is part, as Ellen mentioned, of our speaker series that celebrates our centennial. Beta Gamma Sigma is 100 years old this year, and we have a series of special events that highlight the organization's commitment to excellence in scholarship, excellence in business, and uh, ethical business leadership. So we're really, really proud to uh, be collaborating with the John, L. John Cook School of Business here at St. Louis University. Uh, our association so, uh, society was founded in 1913, February 19th, in fact, and we will be celebrating uh, our next uh, Meet the Leaders in Business event on February 19th uh, in Los Angeles. So that will be uh, an event to look forward to, and it will be uh, webcast as well. So I encourage you to, to tune in to that one. I would also take this time to uh, thank the John L. Cook School of Business, Dean Harshman, uh, for all that you and your staff have done to organize and host this event. And we look proud uh, to you, uh, proudly, as you put together such a great program. I also want to thank our panelists tonight for uh, being here with us. And I look forward to your exciting remarks and uh, your comments about what's going on in the gaming business. So once again, on behalf of Beta Gamma Sigma, I'd like to uh, thank you for all for coming and participating, and I do encourage you to be active tonight and ask 
great questions of our wonderful panelists. Thank you. Karen, again, thanks for joining us this evening. And there are some uh, other members of Beta Gamma Sigma here that I'll introduce in a little while. But now to our main attraction and the very pro provocative topic of dealing with doing business in a highly regulated environment. Virginia McDowell is the Chief Executive Officer and President of the Isle of Capri Casinos. Her leadership in the field has consisted of regional and, and destination markets coupled with success in the areas of operations, information technology, business development, and marketing. She was named the Gaming Executive of the Year in 2009 by the Casino Journal Magazine. I'm proud to say that Virginia is a member of the John Cook School of Business Executive Advisory Board, as well as a member of the Board of Trustees at St. Louis University. I'm also proud to say that she is the mother of one of our graduates from the Cook School here, uh, and, uh, and, just a, and just an all-around great friend uh, of the school and the university. Virginia is going to introduce her colleagues who've joined her this evening. Uh, before she begins that, just, you know, we'll have a reception after the program, and it might be a fun time for you to talk with her about stories that she could tell you about her work with Donald Trump. Um, so, so I'm sorry that uh, rules out the people who are, who are joining us through the web, uh, but the, the people who are here will have, have the opportunity to hear some fun stories. So uh, before then, so then I will just uh, introduce Virginia and ask her to tell you uh, about her colleagues and share her remarks with you about her experiences in the gaming industry and in that very challenging and interesting environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Marshall, for the invitation. It's certainly a to be here. And uh, thanks to Beta Gamma Sigma for inviting us to be part of the Centennial Program. Uh, thanks to all of those of you who have joined us at the John Cook School of Business, uh, and quite frankly, those that are joining us via the webcast uh, in the United States, in Canada, and across the world, I was going to say good evening. Uh, I have no idea what time it is in Kuwait, or Peru for that matter, so I'll say good evening, good morning, and good afternoon. Uh, I was a guest panelist uh, a couple of weeks ago at the Harvard Club in New York City for a Wells Fargo women's panel discussion on risk management. Uh, the rest of the women on the panel were mostly women who were in banking or financial services, uh, and they were lamenting uh, how they and their clients were going to um, be impacted uh, as a result of the regulatory issues associated with the implementation of Dodd-Frank. And uh, I told them that I completely understood uh, what they were saying as gaming is one of the, if not the most highly regulated businesses in the United States, and a few of them kind of raised their eyebrows at that. Uh, and said, you know, well, that can't be right. The, the, you know, Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act is something that's, you know, dramatically going to change the regulatory environment for financial services. And I said, well, yes, but in my business, I have regulators who literally sit in my building in the corner of a room every single moment that we are open. And I said, it's an entirely different uh, environment than obviously what you're used to dealing with right now. In addition to that, those of us who work in the industry have to be licensed uh, as individuals as well as the companies that we work for. Uh, while we as a company have billions of dollars uh, invested across the United States, uh, what we like to tell people is, is that our most important assets are our licenses. We truly cannot operate without our licenses. Uh, and as a result of that, we are a company that is extremely focused on government uh, and compliance issues in general, both at the corporate and the site levels. So for those of you who are not familiar with Isle of Capri, uh, we are actually headquartered here in St. Louis. We're one of the largest publicly traded gaming companies in the United States. People are often uh, surprised to hear that. They're also often surprised to hear that we are headquartered here in St. Louis and don't have a casino here. So people are always saying to me, which one is yours? And I say none, and they kind of look at me with that blank stare. Um, we actually, the, the company was originally headquartered in Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, the uh, headquarters was essentially destroyed after Hurricane Katrina. And when they talked to the staff uh, and they talked to the, you know, the, the folks in the corporate office and said, you know, would you like to rebuild here? Uh, they said, no, probably it would be better if we found someplace else to go. And uh, we looked at the distribution of our properties across the United States. 
I was going to say we have 16, because as of today we did, but we sold one about two hours ago, about two hours ago. So we're back down to 15 across the United States. But if you look at the distribution, we're pretty much right up the Mississippi River. Uh, our furthest casino west is in Colorado. Uh, east at this point is in Florida, although we're in the process of building one in Pennsylvania. Uh, and then in Iowa, Missouri, uh, and Mississippi, and Louisiana. Uh, we have about 13,000 slot machines across the enterprise. We operate about 300 table games. Uh, we have about 2,000 rooms in eight hotels and about 8,000 employees across the United States. Uh, we recognize, particularly the three of us that are sitting here at this table, that effective regulation is a cornerstone of the commercial gaming industry. Uh, it assures customers that the games are fair, and it assures the communities that casino management uh, and the ownership of the companies are trustworthy. But because regulation needs to evolve uh, as the industry matures, and particularly as advancing technology transforms the industry, uh, we also recognize that the regulatory environment is dynamic and that establishing a collaborative and productive uh, relationship with regulators is critical. One of the things that we've learned that is key to being effective uh, is making certain that everybody knows what role they play in the process. So I am joined here today by two of my senior colleagues uh, who spend either most of or a great deal of their time working within the regulatory framework. Uh, and I will tell you that me personally, our shareholders, uh, our customers and our employees are extremely fortunate to have two professionals of their caliber who are on the front lines on a regulatory basis uh, on a daily, uh, or regulatory front on a daily basis. Uh, they are both subject matter experts in their respective fields. They are highly regarded uh, and I, allow me to introduce them to you. Beginning immediately to my left, that would be the woman. <laughs> G. Murray Wilkins is Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer for Isle of Capri Casinos. She is responsible for developing information services, gaming technology, and business intelligence strategy, as well as aligning IS operations with the company's key operating initiatives and long-range goals. She has a 25-year-old technology, a 25-year-old, do you love that? I was just gonna say, she's a 25-year technology professional. She started when she was four. She's worked for a major US slot machine and gaming system supplier, casino companies in state regulated tribal and international gaming jurisdictions, in riverboats, regional and destination casino resorts. Uh, those of you who want to have the Donald Trump conversation afterwards, she also worked with me at Trump Entertainment Resorts. She served on the board of directors of the Gaming Standards Association, the regulatory technology committees of the New Jersey Casino Association, Illinois Gaming Association, Missouri Gaming Association, and the American Gaming Association's Advisory Work Group on Internet Gaming. To her left is Michael Fries, who joined Isle of Capri in 2010 as Vice President of Legal Affairs. He is primarily responsible for regulatory and compliance function and serves as our corporate compliance officer. Mike graduated from the John Marshall Law School in Chicago in 1986, began his career in private practice. He has a self-described eclectic litigation and appellate practice until 2001 when he began working for the Illinois Gaming Board. Mike's experience in gaming law was fine-tuned as he worked his way from legal counsel to deputy chief legal counsel, and in 2005 became general counsel to the Illinois Gaming Board. He served as an adjunct professor at Loyola University Chicago School of Law from 2008 through 2010 where he taught gaming law and now teaches gaming law at a university in St. Louis that is not this one. <laughs> So I'm going to begin with Mike because I think that it's absolutely wonderful that we have a former regulator as a member of this panel and just the unique perspective that he brings. Um, why don't you give us a little bit of background, what you did in your previous position, uh, and tell us in general, uh, what do regulators pay attention to? Well, I would first note that that's the first time that Virginia has called me a former regulator. She, <laughs> she usually calls me on a day-to-day -day basis a recovering regulator. <laughs> um, regulators pay attention to to everything. Um, in my former position, I, I was lucky enough to, to start as brought into the gaming board as a, um, a trial attorney and tried many administrative proceedings before uh, moving up in the, in the ranks, so to speak. Um, and the job with, as the general counsel entailed a very wide scope of responsibilities from dealing with the executive branch, the legislative branch, the press, 
uh, major policy issues uh, and initiatives to trying to secure new technology for, for agents uh, along with the day-to-day -day, uh, grind of a state agency. Uh, in, the, in the regulatory environment, the, the, the goal, obviously, in the gaming is the integrity of gaming. It's the number one uh, core of the entire uh, scope of the, uh, the uh, objective, I should say. And there's a lot of similarity to that as a regulator to what I now do for Isle of Capri. Maintaining the integrity of gaming in Illinois was our primary uh, mandate. Uh, coming into private industry, it's maintaining the integrity of both the business, the Isle of Capri's um, business and all of the jurisdictions that we are in. Uh, as, and if you do that, if we can accomplish that in our business, then we, we self-serve uh, in the larger goal of maintaining the integrity of the gaming industry, which makes everybody happy. Um, and that's what we do. We try to make regulators happy. As I indicated earlier, many professionals that I speak to are absolutely amazed at the licensing process that we have to go through as individuals as well as just the scope of the process that we have to go through as a company. Why don't you um, give us a little bit of an overview on that, Mike? Uh, that could be the entire hour. Uh, <laughs> licensing is, is everything in the, in the uh, casino industry. Uh, there's the breadth of it, whether or not licensing is mandatory or whether it's discretionary. Uh, there are different facets to each of those. But I should say to begin with that you have to understand the, the legal nature of a gaming license. A, a, a license is a piece of paper uh, that allows you to engage in conduct that would otherwise be uh, illegal. And it is, your, it is our most valuable asset, as Virginia alluded to earlier. Without it, we could not conduct our business. Uh, we are a publicly traded company. We have shareholders uh, and that would not go over well with them. So in order to maintain that, uh, everybody in, in the industry is licensed. Um, the depth of that is, varies depending on the, the nature of your job. The general manager of a casino is going to undergo a much different licensing background investigation than the person who's the valet or the cook uh, for obvious reasons. Um, if it's a, so individuals will vary with position, corporations will vary depending on whether they're private or public. In a privately held company that owns a casino, every owner will undergo a background investigation. In a publicly held company, it's typically those shareholders that own 5% or more of the company will have to undergo some type of a background investigation. And then with the corporation also, employees, depending on the corporate employees, depending on their function and their relationship to the casino, will have to undergo some type of uh, investigation. And typically all the members of the board of directors and the officers of the, of the company will also have to undergo uh, investigations. So what type of criteria is involved? It's typically three different things. The uh, personal suitability of the individuals is, is uh, one of the criteria the business and financial integrity and suitability of the company itself and the individuals is looked at. And then the location where the casino is located uh, is going to also be undergo some type of scrutiny. The level of review is also another uh, scope of licensing. Uh, full investigation for those people that have ultimate control and responsibility for the day-to-day -day of the casino. Uh, very extensive financial background, personal background, talk to your neighbors, all things of the, uh, I, I, can't, I can't stress enough how extensive the background investigation is from essentially when you were 18 years old uh, until present. Um, they'll, the, the review will go through your, all of your bank accounts, all of your credit card accounts, um, they will look to see where the source of uh, money comes from and it needs to be documented. Uh, they will calculate your net worth. Um, they will look at your past conduct, whether or not you have arrests in your background, convictions in your background, what they were for, uh, civil litigation, uh, financial litigation, um, and reputation.
those will all be examined by the regulators for those folks that are in control uh, or own a certain level of the, of the enterprise. Um, those people that I mentioned earlier that, are, that are, have less uh, control may have to undergo simple fingerprinting and just to make sure that they're not a uh, convicted felon. And that would be the, the extent of their background investigation. Uh, the standard of licensing process I think is important uh, for people to understand in this highly regulated environment. Um, applicants have to prove it's the, the burden is on the applicant, the burden is on the licensee to maintain what is known in the industry as suitability. It's a, uh, it's a legal fiction. It's, it's, a, um, it's a term of art uh, that is used in the, in the casino industry to, it, it means that you don't have anything in your background that would make you ineligible from being licensed and working in, in this industry. It means that there's nothing about you that would embarrass the jurisdiction in which you are working. It means that there's nothing about you that would, it, that would impugn the integrity of gaming in the jurisdiction that you're working in. Uh, and you have the burden of maintaining that suitability throughout your, your career. And if the regulator believes that that suitability is called into question, um, they will investigate it. There, there's a number of things that they can do with that. Um, but it all comes down to the legal nature of the license, and uh, it's a privilege, it is not a right, and everybody that works in this industry is well aware of that. Uh, just in terms of the, the scope of what regulators touch, we opened, as I indicated earlier, our 16th casino in uh, Cape Girardeau uh, just a couple weeks ago, and I think that uh, I mentioned earlier, as the industry evolves and, and technology evolves, um, it just becomes an increasingly more complex environment. And I think so many people uh, that work with us at the corporate office and aisle were absolutely amazed at just the amount of divisions and departments and things in general uh, that Jean Marie and the corporate IT team touch. As a matter of fact, somebody remarked that you can't even pour a drink anymore without technology. So why don't you give us a little overview of uh, what you spent the last couple of months doing and uh, how you interacted with regulators as a part of that. Sure. So with any, with any new casino opening, any new property opening, the, 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 the main goal with your regulator is to maintain a, a truly collaborative effort. It is in everyone's interest, the regulator's interest, taxpayer's interest, our shareholder's interest, to open a casino as smoothly as possible and in complete compliance with all of the rules. The rules are extensive, and we start meeting with our regulators for a new casino opening, in some cases more than a year before the casino is scheduled to open its doors. Um, as Virginia says, every department in a casino, and depending on whether that casino is also a resort property with a hotel and other amenities, has some technological uh, requirements and so we talk about the valet parking system and the liquor control systems and the casino management systems and the slot accounting systems uh, the typical back of the house systems that any business is 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 accustomed to those related to personnel human resources and all of those are subject not only to the typical regulation the HIPAA regulation the Sarbanes-Oxley regulation uh, in the case of casino uh, systems and casino operations were also subject to many provisions of the Patriot Act because of the volume of uh, cash transactions that take place in a casino. Um, and all of those uh, regulators, auditors, internal and external auditors are supplemented by, and in some cases, um, the, the uh, work product is reviewed by typically a regulator who is the gaming regulator in the jurisdiction in which your casino operates. And so you have this additional layer of oversight um, with, a, with a fairly heavy expectation on the part of the regulator that, um, that your business will respond to their need to perform their function as is mandated in the jurisdiction in which they're doing business. And so we spend about a year and we start with every business process that's going to take place on the premises. And we go through those processes and we try to understand which of them are subject to the regulator and which requirements that the regulator 
uh, will need to have us meet have to be managed through technology or aided by technology. And it is a lengthy process and it is, as I say, a collaborative process. But our goal at the end of the day is to make sure that, as Mike alluded to earlier, really no one is embarrassed that the, that the operation is worthy of the trust of the taxpayers and worthy of the trust of the eventual patrons that are going to cross over our threshold and that nobody gets to read their name in the newspaper because something disastrous has happened. Uh, you and I have been in the business for just a few years and, and I think when we started out slot machines were still what we affectionately refer to as one-armed bandits. Uh, and that's certainly not the case anymore. Uh, what we now call electronic gaming devices are, are extremely complicated and sophisticated uh, boxes. So why don't you give us a little uh, history of that and then uh, uh, once and for all tell everybody what a random number generator is so that people will stop asking us where the hot machines are. So uh, as it relates to the regulator, one of, one of their principal um, mandates is to make sure that when we talk about integrity of gaming that that extends into the actual integrity of the game itself. So the outcome of any gambling game should be fair and it should be honest. Those are, those are sort of two different things. Fair is typically um, measured by the payback, the percentage of the, of, the, of the wager that's made that is expected to be returned to the patron over the course of the time that that, gam that game is available to the public. Um, the honest outcome is that each and every outcome of each and every wager is, that is dictated by the odds and that the odds remain consistent across the performance of that machine. And so those things are dictated by, on the, on the fairness side, the mathematics that go into the number of outcomes that are available on the slot machine and the honesty is dictated by the random number generator in a slot machine. And the random number generator is in, in very simple terms, if you think about the, the lottery drawing with the ping pong balls in the, in the air driven ping pong ball mixer uppers. That wasn't very good. Um, very technical term. Very technical term. Um, each of those, you'll, you'll, each of those compartments contains a possible outcome. Each contains a number of ping pong balls with numbers on them. And each of those is randomly going to be driven into the tube that's going to tell you what that particular ping pong ball, the value of that. And as you move across, you will get, depending on which lottery you're looking at, three or four or five positions across that uh, lottery outcome. And if you translate that into the reels on a slot machine, that number corresponds with some of the symbols that you see on the slot machine. That randomness is continuous. And so as you approach the machine and you put your dollar in and you push the button, the random number generator dictates what the outcome on that machine will be. Um, these are subject to pretty uh, in, intensive testing in both uh, independent gaming laboratories and by the individual regulators in each jurisdiction in which we do business. And so I wish I could, but I really can't tell you where the hot slot machine is. Uh, Mike, each of the aisle properties operates uh, under a very uh, specific series of internal control and uh, there's a difference between internal controls, uh, the audit function, compliance, and regulatory, and I think that some people get a little confused about that. Why don't you give us a, an overview of what the internal control process is to begin with, and then uh, the difference between the compliance and the regulatory function? Sure. Um, I remember when I first got into this business and I was at was introduced to the concept of internal controls as it relates to casinos and I could not believe the scope and the detail that was encompassed by them. Uh, these are, depending on your jurisdiction, and not all jurisdictions are the same. Some jurisdictions are much looser uh, with what is required for internal controls, but the majority of them, certainly the ones in the Midwest, uh, are have very detailed requirements. These are these are binders that could be upwards of a thousand pages with a, with a minute detail of 
how things have to happen in the order that they have to happen and who can do them in a casino. From purchasing to how things are viewed in surveillance to how a deck of cards is opened up and spread out on a, on a table. It's all written down in a book and it has to be filed. If it's not filed, it's technically a violation and the, depending on the number of times that violation happens or the, the, the circumstances in which it happens, it could lead to discipline. Um, so the internal controls are really operating procedures um, and there is an ongoing debate in the industry about whether how, how much how detailed they need to be in some states I know there's a pushback to try to get some states to relax those requirements uh, there's a great deal of training that goes on with internal controls each department is responsible for following the internal controls that relate to that department. Um, so somebody that works in the cage would not be required to know what the internal controls are for surveillance or for purchasing. Um, interestingly, the internal audit function, uh, however, is, it would be different. Uh, that person that works in internal audit would eventually, over the course of time, learn all of the internal controls because they would be they would be auditing to see whether or not those procedures were being followed in each one of the departments at the casino. Uh, compliance and regulatory uh, in general um, are two technically different things, but they are very much intertwined. Very basically, compliance is something is due, something is due to be uh, filed or some information is due to be communicated at a certain time. And if you don't file it on time, or you don't communicate that information on time, you are out of compliance. There are elements involved in the compliance of timeliness, of completeness, and accuracy. Uh, those are all tied into that. Regulatory issues, on the other hand, I view more as conduct. Um, are the employees complying with and acting within the framework of the internal controls of the regulations of the jurisdiction of the law itself, the enabling statute that allowed gambling in that in that state. Um, there is extensive overlap. Um, together, I would say that compliance and regulatory functions are about the identification and limitation of risk to the business. And in, in, in a big picture, that's really what those two functions are there for. And to, to maintain the integrity of the business and the gaming industry. Uh, it's interesting because we can sometimes be our own worst enemy on this when we're when we're writing and, and designing and building internal controls because once we make a determination as to what we're going to put in that binder with a thousand pages, then internal audit has to audit against it. And, in, and internal audit in some of our jurisdictions then has to take their audit findings uh, by state regulation and send them to the regulators. So the state regulators are then uh, observing us based on, on a set of rules that we had defined for ourselves. And I'll tell you how crazy it can be sometimes when I first joined Isle of Capri, we literally had one of those uh, thousand page binders. You do have the ability to change or to update your internal controls, you just have to get approval to do that. And I realized that there was a serious need when I found an internal control for how to clean a window. And it started with fill the bucket with water. <laughs> and the second was open the blinds. And I said, this, is, this has got to go. Now that's, that's something obviously that, that is very minor and very trivial, but we do have serious regulatory issues that surface sometimes. Um, and what happens, Mike, how do we handle that when we do identify our regulatory issues? Um, first thing that we try to do is we try to verify that what is being, what's being told to us, typically over the phone or through an email, actually did occur and that it occurred the way that it's being portrayed. Um, and when it happened. Um, obviously, if something happened three weeks ago, I'm, I'm more upset about, I'm about, I'm upset about the fact that I haven't heard about it for three weeks because there's other implications with that. Um, what kind of a problem is it that, that is being communicated to us is, is, uh, is important. Uh, in other words, do I need to call the risk department if somebody, has somebody died on a property, has somebody fallen and gotten seriously injured? Uh, that, that, that's one set of phone calls that have to take place. Um, is it something so significant that it could affect um, our, our investor relations? Do we need to get our PR people involved and, and assess 
what this could do to the stock price. Uh, but in the regulatory environment, more, most importantly for, the, for this discussion, uh, I would say that is, is it something that is of so, such importance or significance that it immediately needs to be communicated to the regulators in that various jurisdiction? And sometimes it is. Um, if, if it's that serious, uh, you can't wait to, to tell them next week. It's something that needs to be communicated no matter what time of the day it is. Uh, you need to pick up the phone and have those contacts already established. And we have those contacts established in all the jurisdictions that we're in that I can make those calls in the middle of the night. And I get those calls in the middle of the night from, from regulators for various things. In other words, for self-reporting. Yes, if need be. Um, Jean Marie, even more complicated than the slot machines uh, are the systems that connect them. And she alluded uh, earlier when we were talking about Cape Girardeau just to the breadth of, of systems that she touches. Uh, one of the things that I think truly changed our industry was uh, what we call Tito, affectionately referred to as Tito, which was the killer app that totally changed gaming uh, and I think totally changed the regulatory environment as well. Um, why don't you tell us about that? So uh, in, in the early days of casino regulation and in the early days of, of electronic gaming devices or even before that electromagnetic gaming devices, slot machines, um, Almost every action that took place that could affect the game, could affect the calculation of the tax that was due to, this, to the state, um, happened within, it was confined within that box, was confined within the slot machine itself. Um, as, as time went on, uh, the industry realized that there was a wealth of information that was happening there, whether it was the individual patron's interaction with the slot machine or the accounting of the slot machine or the security associated with what was happening with that slot machine. And so we hooked up wires to them. And we hooked up wires to them so that we could start to monitor what was happening within that device and with the interaction between the players and those devices. For the most part, the regulators were not particularly interested in those monitoring systems unless we were using the monitoring system or the output, the data from the monitoring system, in order to report to them taxes and other information about the securities of the, system, of, of the casino floor. It was a one-way listening device for the most part. At some point in time, uh, folks decided that it was inconvenient, dirty, messy, and operationally inefficient to continue to force people to put quarters into slots if they wanted to move from a slot machine that would accept a quarter to a slot machine that would accept a nickel, they had to go somewhere and exchange the quarters for nickels. Um, we had issues with just managing that sh the sheer volume of, of, and weight of all of that coin. And so technology was devised that would allow for the credit meter on the slot machine to, to print a barcoded instrument, a ticket that came out of the slot machine that said, how much in currency the credits on your slot machine were worth, and to take that to another slot machine and have that read by the next one and translate that into how many credits could go onto the credit meter of the slot machine. So you could continue to play and you could move around without carrying all those buckets of coins. What happened at that point, though, was that the systems to which these games were connected now could affect the calculation of revenue, the credits on the credit meter that the patron was entitled to collect at the end of their play, and the regulators really had to start to pay slightly more attention, actually quite a bit more attention to these systems than they had previously paid. It was disruptive technology in the sense that it was universally helpful for the industry. It, was, it, it helped us to gain operational efficiency and at the same time elevated the customer experience, and that's sort of a home run on, in, in everybody's book, but it easily tripled or quadrupled the amount of regulatory scrutiny that then had to go into the management of these systems that were tracking all of the information related to these monetary transactions that were happening between the slot machine and, uh, and the, the financial system. And so an entire new area of expertise needed to be developed in pretty short order uh, among our regulators uh, in order for them to be able to accept the technology and allow us to use it on the casino floor. 
and it took in some jurisdictions a number of years for them to get into a position where they had the expertise in order to evaluate whether this technology was safe, whether it could interfere with the, with the play of the game, and, and whether they should let it go forward in their jurisdiction. I will add to that that on a personal note, the first time I met Jean Marie was sitting across uh, opposite sides of the table in, I want to say, 2002-ish, um, when she was working um, for a company that was trying to install Tito in Illinois, and that's exactly what she was doing. She was explaining to us how this was going to work, and we were talking about internal controls, and it was a long, long process. And really, it is, it is, it is our job and Mike's now that he's sitting on this side of the table with us, to help the regulator get to the point where they can have a comfort level that they're protecting the public adequately and to understand that this technology is not going to cause harm. In fact, it will, it will do good for the industry. Mike, you're responsible for uh, regulatory compliance in uh, six states. We're licensed in a seventh. We're building in an eighth. So are, are regulations pretty much the same across the board in those jurisdictions? Um, yes and no. Um, the concepts of oversight and taxation and licensing are present in each jurisdiction uh, in one form or another. Uh, I think the most challenging difficulty in this area is um, a very broad definition that exists in every state is having to do with the integrity of gaming and that all of us are subject to discipline if we act or fail to act uh, in such a way that it's injurious to the industry or to the health, safety, or morals of the, of the state in which we operate. That phrase is in almost every single uh, rule or regulation. Every state has adopted that concept in one form or another. And I think the challenge um, is trying to um, manage that in each, in each jurisdiction because it's different. What is, what is a, a problem in one state, what a, what a state trooper in one state finds to be a moral problem or something that is injurious uh, might not be in another state. And we are one company operating in all these jurisdictions, so one set of facts, the same set of facts in multiple jurisdictions can be handled multiple ways, and we have to react to that and, and actually be very proactive for that and find out what those concerns are and make sure that our people that work in those jurisdictions are aware of those concerns. And we have a lot of people that transfer within our, our, our company from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction over the course of their career. And uh, they, they find out firsthand how different it is in one jurisdiction over another. And we try to, uh, to be proactive with that and, and have conversations with them and warn them about what they're getting into when they move to, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction to avoid problems. Uh, for both panelists, uh, when I was upstairs uh, before we came down here today, a, a few of the folks that I was talking to were asking about Internet gaming. Uh, there's been some news recently. Uh, the two senators in Nevada, uh, Senators Reed and Senators Heller, uh, have been talking about the fact that they don't think that they have the vote to get a federal online gaming bill through the lame duck session. Um, for both panelists, what are your thoughts on Internet gaming? Handicap, does it go at the federal or state level, and what are the regulatory implications of both? Well, I'll start out very generally and then turn it over to Jean Marie, <laughs> but if I had to handicap, I would say it would go state first. It already is going state. Um, the federal government, other than um, regulating Indian gaming, doesn't really regulate gambling at all. It, it has proscribed certain conduct in various statutes that is criminal, but it's never been in the business of regulating. Uh, now it's different, obviously, with, with Indian tribal gaming. Um, the only thing that I will say with any certainty is that internet, internet gaming is going to happen. When and how, what the breadth of it, I don't know yet, but it's here, it's going to happen. And I think it's also useful to note that it, it's happening now. It's happening now not just in international jurisdictions where uh, online poker is in fact legal. It's happening 
um, as it relates to paramutual wagering. There is legal gambling on horse racing in the United States today. Um, there are lotteries with websites that you can subscribe to. There are now lotteries in, uh, in Canada that are operating gambling sites. And so as each day passes, and, and Nevada has just licensed any number of entities to whom they expect to give permission to operate legal online gambling. So as each day passes, I think Mike is right, um, waiting for the federal government to catch up is going to become more and more of an exercise in futility. There, there will be gambling. It will happen from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And some of the challenges that we're going to have as the result of that are some of the same challenges that, that Mike just described as it relates to we do business in a bricks and mortar casino in, uh, in six jurisdictions today. Uh, each of those jurisdictions has their own uh, set of rules and their own set of regulations. In some cases, those evolved over time with not just conflicting but, but, but absolutely opposed views about how things ought to be done. And I think we're going we're to continue to see that kind of development as online gaming develops in state jurisdictions without uniform regulation. Uh, we're going to have regulation at, at, the, at, the, at the whim of each of the jurisdictions that adopts it as it comes forward. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions, Dean Harshman. Uh, for those here at the John Cook School of Business and, and listening across the United States and the world that we haven't scared yet, um, <laughs> To the extent that you want to uh, look at or, or evaluate a career in gaming, uh, why don't both of you tell us a little bit about the positions in your department, what kind of degrees, and to the extent that anybody would like to work in the gaming industry uh, in the regulatory compliance, IT, audit, whatever it might be, function, um, what kind of degrees, what kind of training uh, would be helpful? Go ahead. Uh, we have uh, in the IT department, in the corporate IT department in our St. Louis office, there are, there, we have 50 individuals. They, they range from folks who work on our help desk and 24-7 help desk operations for our properties to uh, vice president of information technology whose responsibility includes the security of the networks, uh, PC deployment, systems management, system security, uh, backups, the traditional bits and bytes, plug it in IT. Um, we also have a division that, that is our business intelligence division whose job it is to supply the rest of the business with data and uh, analysis tools that enable us to support decisions across the enterprise. And we have sort of an amorphous utility infielder, our vice president of Biz business strategy, whose job it really is to make sure that we align the needs of the business with the technology that we're deploying and who spends a good deal of his time making sure that the technologies that we'd like to deploy are going to meet the regulatory requirements in the various jurisdictions in which we do business. Um, in the traditional IT uh, field, uh, we, have a, we have a development group. We, we build software. We build uh, technology to elevate the guest experience. We manage that software. We buy software from off the shelf, and our technical services groups are responsible for that. I can tell you as it relates to regulatory questions, um, IT in a, in a gaming company is as much a compliance department as it is a technology department. Um, we are, for the most part, key licensed individuals or licensed at the highest level because of the access that we have to the systems that are important to the operation of the gaming floor. And it is typically our job to either facilitate compliance with regulations or to uh, monitor compliance with regulations. And if I haven't scared you completely, we'd like you to come and talk to us. <laughs> I have three people. Um, uh, they are exceptional. Uh, they all come from the industry. They all started out in various jobs, whether it was in the cage or on the casino floor and slots. Um, or as an admin in another company doing uh, contract reviews. Um, their experience in the industry is, is really the focus of what I, where I'm going to try to go to here is that uh, they don't have a particular degree or anything. They just have, over a long period of time, built up a great knowledge of how a casino works. And that's, a, that's a, such an asset 
uh, in the compliance and the regulatory department because they, they truly do know all things that are happening in the casino from the cage to, to surveillance to the back of the house administrative offices. They know who is supposed to be where, when, who can't go where and to certain spots. Uh, they, they're, they're really truly like encyclopedias. Um, so you don't, you don't really need a particular degree uh, to work in compliance. Um, obviously for the legal aspect of it, you'll, you'll need a legal degree. Um, auditing is another um, department that works closely with compliance and with regula uh, regulatory bodies and um, obviously some type of uh, business background or accounting background is typically what I think the auditors look for when they're hiring. Um, but I would suggest if you wanted to get into this business more than anything is just get in it and get a job in it and you will over time um, you will find your niche, you will find what you're good at and you'll, you'll, you might be surprised at what you're good at and what the opportunities are there for you. Thank you. So you heard uh, Virginia say something about questions. And uh, I'd like first to thank our panelists for their formal presentation. And we could do that by applause. We could do that. And, and they have graciously agreed to answer questions. Uh, when people, the people who are here in St. Louis uh, got a little card uh, that you could fill out, we thought we'd, I'd probably better read the questions so that we, uh, so we had the, the better quality of sound for our webcast. So if you have those uh, and could pass those to the aisle, uh, I think there's someone here who's going to pick those up for you. Uh, and uh, and we're, get, we're going to be taking questions from the, uh, our, our friends and colleagues who've enjoyed, who are, have joined us by the webcast. While we're waiting to do that, uh, just a couple of things. Uh, uh, one of the things that I thought I might mention is some of you may have noticed that there's an owl sitting on the table. And I don't know, many Beta Gamma Sigma members will, will realize that that's Professor Elwell. Professor Elwell has been traveling around the world celebrating the centennial. So he's here with us tonight. Uh, he was the first president, I hope I'm right about that, the first president of Beta Gamma Sigma. And so he's enjoying his 100th anniversary uh, as a mascot. And I should say, it's not St. Louis University's mascot because we don't have enough time for me to explain what a billiken is. Uh, and so for those of you who are out there across the world, uh, send, a, send a text and I'll get back to you on that. Uh, so now we do have some questions and if I could have those. And Virginia, you anticipated, of course, my, my question, which was, how do we educate our students so that they could find jobs with you? And, and I heard, Mike, I heard you say, just get a job. Uh, so it sounds to me as though there are lots of opportunities. And so just, uh, well, I'll sort through these for a moment, but could you just talk about what you see as the future of the industry and its growth potential? It's interesting. We were just having this conversation today in terms of, of looking at opportunities. Um, one of the states that is currently going through the process of they've legalized gaming and they're now actually uh, looking at how they're going to implement it is Massachusetts. And Massachusetts has a number of licenses and a couple of different categories that are available um, that there is massive competition for uh, from a lot of the gaming uh, companies in the United States because it's one of the last states uh, at this point that is considered an opportunity. So what started out as a bidding process, for, for example, for the license in, in Western Massachusetts uh, started out as a $300 million project, and now I think they have, what, four or five different companies that are vying for projects that are now up to a billion dollars apiece. So it is an industry that is still growing. Uh, one of the issues that we face is that there has been cannibalization uh, of regional casinos. Uh, which is one of the reasons why people were rather surprised when we were chosen uh, for the last license in the state of Missouri. 
uh, that we chose to locate it in Cape Girardeau because many people believe that with the population bases in either uh, St. Louis or in Kansas City, that it would be far better served to locate a casino there. Uh, as we said when we testified before the Missouri Gaming Commission, uh, we believe that there was already capacity issues in uh, the two major cities because of the number of casinos that were already there. But if you take the casino to an outstate area, uh, Cape Girardeau is actually the largest city between St. Louis and Memphis um, and in underserved market. So we believe that there is growth potential in the industry. You just have to be careful. Uh, deployment of capital and, and getting returns on it is one of the biggest issues that we have right now. Uh, and companies like us just have to be careful in terms of the opportunity that we're looking for. But uh, I think it's safe to say there will always be jobs in gaming. Students keep that in mind. Uh, so kind of following on that question about economics, uh, someone here in St. Louis has asked, according to your experience, Virginia, what has been the impact of the economic crisis on the gaming business uh, in the past three years? We, it, it was, again, very interesting for us. Um, we're not a movie theater. Uh, when people walk through our front door, they bring with them the amount of money they choose to invest in their entertainment experience. So we don't charge an admission. So as we went through the, the couple of years of the, of the Great Recession, and, and quite frankly, we're still, as we like to call it, bumping along the bottom right now, uh, what we found is, is that we have been so successful in uh, creating a great entertainment experience for our customers that there was very high demand for the product. And because we don't charge an admission for it, during the recession, when people were looking to have fun, they would come to us actually in higher numbers, increased numbers uh, in some cases, uh, than prior to the bottom falling out of the economy. Our problem is, is that when they were coming, they were bringing less money. So the issue that we had is, is that we had to staff the volume because we had all of these people that were there, but because they were bringing less money, we had tremendous compression on margins. And again, a big problem that the industry faced because you know, we were all under pressure, particularly those of us that are publicly traded companies, uh, to be able to show a return for our shareholders. And, as a result of this, one of the things that we had to do is to um, literally uh, go through our database, look at the profitability of our customers, and you know there were quite frankly some customers that we couldn't talk to anymore uh, that we didn't market to. So that's the way that we survived. Uh, there were several people uh, who had questions about your business strategy, uh, kind of all connected to the economics, and I think you've touched on that. So I'm going to move to something that's completely different. Uh, and Jean Marie, this may be one for you. Uh, software errors seem to be inevitable. And okay, <laughs> she's nodding. Um, and and difficult to identify. Um, with the stakes so high, uh, in such a highly regulated industry, how do you ensure the integrity of your software? Well, we're, we're extremely careful about the integrity of the software. In, in, uh, in, most of the, in, in the case of most of the software that's designated by gaming regulators as critical IT systems, that software is uh, purchased. It is subject to the examination of an independent laboratory. Um, and the, the steps that follow that, depending on how large your casino operation is, we're, we're fortunate. Um, we have a, a live lab that we can test software in that mimics the operation of a casino floor. So as software is developed and new software is, is released to the market, we will work it through our own lab before we release it to and, and install it on the casino floor. Um, even then, there, there are often problems with new software, and our response needs to be a, an immediate, we have to immediately report any issues with software. The regulation actually in some jurisdictions now states um, any incident must be immediately reported. Any incident is a very difficult to define event, and so we find ourselves again working very, very closely with regulators um, when, we're, when we're managing the software that's critical to uh, the operation of the gaming floor. Yeah, Mike, just f uh, put your former regulator hat on for a moment. Do you find that people then, because the stakes are so high, people over-report and then the regulators have to sort through uh, that sort of over-reporting? I, I wouldn't say over-report, but it depends on the, uh, the topic. 
um, the, uh, the matter that's, uh, the, that's being uh, considered. And it also depends on the company. Some companies are, are very much, very more in tune with compliance in the regulatory environment than others. And some take it more seriously than others. But from a regulator's, from a regulator's standpoint, it's a good problem to have. Okay. I mean, just, just as an example of that, um, in one of our state, uh, we probably do a better job of reporting uh, underage gaming than anybody because it's something that's important to us. Um, we, we literally uh, bonus our general managers on, on how well they make sure that we don't have underage gamers on the floor. Uh, and we penalize them as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, in one of these states, uh, you know, we were a little bit concerned because if you looked at the number of underage gamers that were reported, uh, it looked like uh, we had a, an extraordinarily high proportion of them and the regulator said, no, you're the only ones that are actually doing it right. So. So, so, so there is that recognition and kind of that expectation that this, this is really you. Mm -hmm. uh, Along with the fine. Along with the five. Well, <laughs> well, yeah. Okay, so, and the final question, and I'm sorry, we have a lot of good questions, and I'm sure there are more questions coming in. Uh, for the people who have the advantage of being here in St. Louis, of course, we'll have a chance to, to chat uh, upstairs at our reception. Uh, but this is such an interesting question, I just, I'm compelled to ask it. And this is for each of you. In your jobs, what makes you smile the most? Not getting fined. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> when Mike and Jean Marie keep me out of trouble. <laughs> uh, wow. Well, in general, I think what makes what makes me smile. Uh, IT is still a, a. We talk about IT enabling and creating new revenue opportunities, and we talk about IT in lots of different ways. But IT is still a, a, a service branch of of any business. And it, it always makes me smile when we provide something that makes it possible for any of our team members to do their job better, to do their job more efficiently, and to do their job without personal pain. Um, and and that's, that's on a daily basis. From a regulatory perspective, it makes me smile, as it did when we opened Cape Girardeau, when, uh, when we work very closely and very well with our regulators and we get something accomplished. Uh, in this case, it was the opening of a casino, and in the case of the, the years that I worked with Mike, it was the ability to move new technology into the industry in that jurisdiction, and the regulator and the operator sit next to each other and, and can say, job well done, thanks for your help. I guess generically, <laughs> uh, when it works, uh, and by that, when I, what I mean by that is when um, I believe very strongly that that even though this is a highly regulated industry, um, for the most part, the regulators want it to work and they want it to be um, successful. And when there's a healthy collaboration amongst the regulators and the industry and there's communication and identification of problems and the identification of risk and there's a collaborative, collaborative effort to fix it or prevent it, uh, that makes me smile. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, before Dean Hunter returns to the podium to present a formal appreciation uh, to our panelists, I'd like to take this moment to recognize the staff members of Beta Gamma Sigma who are here this evening. So please stand. Uh, Jim Veland is currently Executive Director of Beta Gamma Sigma. We're very proud that Beta Gamma Sigma is headquartered in St. Louis, and so we have access to these folks when we might not otherwise. He's joined by his colleagues Tim Weatherby, uh, and you can stand, thank you. Uh, and Amber Nicholson and Natalie Ush. Uh, I think that's everybody from Beta Gamma Sigma. Uh, so it's really wonderful that you'd be here this evening. I know this is a busy time of year for you, so I uh, really appreciate your taking the time to come and, and participate in, in this celebration. Uh, so now I'd like to invite Dean Hunter back uh, to, the, to the podium uh, for a few concluding remarks. Thank you, Ellen, again. Um, before I close our program, I'd like to ask you to join me again in giving a really uh, robust round of applause for our wonderful, outstanding panelists.
Uh, as president of Beta Gamma Sigma, it's my honor to recognize each of our panelists with a small token of the society's appreciation. To Virginia McDowell, president and CEO of Isle of Capri Casinos, thank you so much for moderating and participating uh, in this informative panel discussion. Our members everywhere uh, certainly will benefit from the information that was conveyed tonight. And I'd like to present you with this small token. Why, well, thank you very much. Uh, to Michael Fries, uh, Vice President of Legal Affairs for Isla Capri Casinos, thank you so much for participating and for your insights on the regulatory and um, legal requirements that impact your employees as well as your business and your industry. Thank you. And to uh, Jean Marie Wilkins, Vice President and Chief Information Officer, thank you for your time and your valuable insights from the uh, IT perspective as well as the regulatory perspective. Uh, finally, I would like again to thank uh, the John Cook School of Business, Dean Ellen Harshman and her staff and St. Louis University for collaborating with Beta Gamma Sigma on this very uh, timely and interesting event. I know we have uh, opportunity, as Ellen said, for networking, both here in St. Louis uh, upstairs and locally in the uh, global locations around the, the globe where our, our people are participating in the webcast. So I encourage all of you to uh, get to know one another, to network, and discuss what you've heard tonight. Uh, now I'll turn the program back over to Ellen. And again, thank you for helping Beta Gamma Sigma celebrate its 100th anniversary. And a small token of the appreciation of St. Louis University. Um, <laughs> it's Christmas. <laughs> Thank you. This has been fabulous. And I can promise you that there's not one of us who's ever been a casino who does not believe that there is a hot machine somewhere. <laughs> and so we're going to talk to Jean Marie about that later. <laughs> so I want to thank all of you for being here, uh, either virtually uh, or in person. And, uh, you know, look forward to the uh, the next programs that we have here, we invite you all again. And for all of you, uh, I, I wish you good discussion and, and much success. And remember, Beta Gamma Sigma is all about best in business. So thank you all so much.